it's very important to mention that the success of any program has to start with a champion. And the program that we started, the World Bank Group, and I, I will give some history because I thought it was important for all of you to kind of see chronologically how we've advanced with our internal program. Um, but it, it does need the support at the top, I, you know, and, and uh, President Kim, who left us, unfortunately, in January, late January, uh, was a medical physician. He had started an NGO in development and really did understand. Uh, we have an acting president, uh, a female. In fact, for um, uh, March, you know, Women's Day, uh, we had Madame Lagarde at the IMF and we had Kristalina from the World Bank on a podium. It was very powerful, I have to say. Um, so, you know, you can see, you know, how he, re, you know, considers domestic violence. So as far as the history, uh, the first case was reported in 1974 um, to the Family Network. And the Family Network are spouses uh, of World Bank staff. Eventually, the program developed. Uh, we realized that we needed uh, some support for spouses who were going through relocation. And in 1988, there was a family consultation service that was established off-site for, you know, like an EAP, an employment um, <laughs> service. And, you know, in the early days, spouses did not have shared benefits for pension, for example. And because of the World Bank immunities, uh, if we received a court order, for example, for our garnishment or access to information on salary, we would not accept them. And so um, in 2000, 2001, President Wolfenson um, saw a need to create a program, again, advocated by the Family Network. We had some homicides at the bank in those early years and um, obviously shook, you know, individuals. Um, and we realized that we needed to uh, create an internal program. For those of you that are unfamiliar with the World Bank Group, um, we have about 12,000 people downtown in headquarters in DC, and we have about 25,000 globally. It's a very large organization, and we hire from just about every country. So it's a very multicultural um, you know, organization. We have 140 uh, country offices, 44 are in Africa. And so you can imagine how we're moving staff and their families. Um, and that's why our program was advocated to include the spouses, partners, and children above 18. Um, and so, you know, a couple of years ago, the program that had been under HR was merged uh, as part of the health services department. And, and, and it really is a good fit because the HSD, and, and I did pass out some information, um, has a very holistic view of how to uh, respond to the health and safety of our staff and their families. Um, we had another report that we had our initial report in 2001 that to survey what exactly we were seeing internally to the World Bank. And we had a, an a updated evaluation report in 2016. The challenge is that, you know, in fact, that was brought up today by Dr. Uh, Jaff. Um, many, you know, I think organizations today, I think there's been a lot of progress I see globally on, you know, the, the effort to try to provides uh, resources for staff that are dealing with domestic violence, but what do we do about the perpetrators? Um, the World Bank Group, even though we have our, our president stand on a podium every October for Domestic Violence Awareness Month, saying we will not tolerate um, domestic violence, the reality is that uh, we don't have a policy, we don't terminate unless, based on a staff rule, um, that we, uh, it, unless it's a felony, and those cases are rarely in the criminal courts, correct? Um, so that is a challenge, and I'm looking forward, actually, to, uh, a, you know, a workshop later today on perpetrators. So what do I do? I, um, I do a lot of the outreach prevention. We have an entire team that I'll talk about later. Uh, we see about 200 individuals a year in our program. 70% um, are staff. When the program started in the early days, it was primarily spouses, again, because we were, you know, it was advocated by the spouses. It was a neutral uh, comfort level, I think, for women primarily to go and meet with other women. And these spouses were, you know, educated. In fact, one of the uh, 
you know, initial advocates, it lives here in Toronto, and she was a PhD nutritionist. Um, so didn't have a background necessarily in domestic violence, but they were very savvy, and they knew to surround themselves with experts and brought in, um, you know, had workshops and created, you know, this program. So in the very early days, in those first three to four years, it was primarily um, spouses. And then as the program shifted, we hired more women. We are seeing many more spou- uh, staff members members that are female. Um, We have an average of eight to 10 uh, new cases a month. Uh, The barrier to disclosure of abuse, as you can well imagine, is usually the most uh, concerning for individuals reaching out. And most perpetrators appear to be threatened by anything in power of the women. Particularly in our country offices, we find that if, you know, we're hiring, you know, let's say local staff that are women, the husbands or partners are very intimidated if they're working for the World Bank or the IMF because of their powerful positions in the community. And in many of our, you know, more high-risk countries, we have our drivers that actually pick up and drop off our staff. And so you can imagine how that can change the relationship, the dynamics in a couple, and again, you know, escalate conflict at home. There's a no doubt extremely high uh, linkage to workplace violence. I think the stats, at least in the U.S., are about 70 percent of workplace violence is uh, related to domestic violence. So, you know, how is it impacting the workplace? Well, clearly the physical, emotional health, the isolation from friends, uh, difficulty meeting the needs of the self and and family, the tardiness, um, the decreased concentration, uh, workplace interruptions, the coworkers, um, you know, the concern. Uh, Obviously, there are usually someone in the workplace that is aware, and they don't know how to respond to it. I was just looking at an email in the previous workshop, and this was a friend of a friend, and how do I, you know, help this individual? this friend of mine. Um, the negative, uh, you know, impact on the workplace, the resentment because maybe they're not missing deadlines or maybe they can't go to, you know, travel, what we call mission travel, and it's putting more burden on colleagues. And then on the organization, well, there e- increased threat of violence, the health care costs, which is our, you know, the health services department. Obviously, that's what we care about too. And of course, the productivity. What we find is that we have you know, staff that are, you know, uh, dealing with domestic violence, we have two categories. We have some that are, are super achievers because that's the only place they feel validated is in the workplace. And then the others are crashing. And so, you know, when they come to us, which is usually in crisis, and if they're unable to perform, we usually try to, you know, refer them to our colleagues um, in occupational health to talk about maybe taking some short-term disability. And, you know, for them to, to you know, deal with the issues that they're, you know, they're, you know, they're having at home so that they can come back and actually fight for their jobs because we don't want them to lose their job. Um, These are some statistics that, you know, I pulled together, but again, I'm not going to go into a lot of the details, but obviously, you know, the surveys and the statistics are extremely great as far as um, the costs to a, a business. So what do we do? Uh, We, you know, as I mentioned, the entire program moved internal to HSD two years ago. Up until then, we had an off-site provider that was managing our hotlines and also uh, the counseling services. Our cases are very complex because of the integration with immigration because, for example, in D.C., we hire primarily what we call G4 visa holders, and so their family members are dependents on that G4. And so you can imagine when a couple, you know, is having conflict and there's a protection order and somebody needs to move out, there is a risk of that G4 holder, the spouse, let's say, maybe potentially losing the G4. And so, you know, that's why we felt that we needed to bring the program internal to um, the bank. We were also seeing um, an increase in our country office cases where they're very, very complicated. And for those of you that have any international uh, work, it's, you know, the, we have um, some, you know, very um, inspired, I would say, volunteer attorneys that work on gender-based violence at the World Bank, and they've come together with three composed 
own compendiums that they've created in the last few years. And the most recent one is on global domestic violence laws. And they're on the World Bank website. They're open to anyone to, you know, they want people to know about them. One's on child marriage um, and one on, on FGM. And so um, so what we, you know, so we have, as I mentioned, the 24-7 uh, the hotline. Um, case manager is the first point of contact who does what's a brief. Uh, we're using the Jackie Campbell, Jacqueline Campbell threat assessment. Um, at, right, exactly, danger assessment. And, we, and then we do a risk danger assessment, which is critical to, fig, you know, to identify how high risk of a case we're dealing with. And, of, and then we bring in the counselors that are in-house, um, that are trauma and domestic violence experts um, that will do a two-hour assessment so we have a better understanding. We do the safety planning. Um, and then we have, we partnered, you know, in the early days, I realized, you know, around 2006, that if we didn't have attorneys that were available to consult with our clients because, again, of the complexity of their immigration, they're non-American for the most part, that we were really unable to help them completely. And, you know, it, I mean, obviously in the D.C. area, we have uh, excellent resources, but the NGOs are overwhelmed. And in country offices, you know, in many of these countries, there might be one psychiatrist and two psychologists. And so we needed and limited legal uh, support as well. So we um, we partnered and we have a contract with DV Leap. Um, it's uh, affiliated with G uh, George Washington University. We have two national experts in domestic violence that will do a consult on the phone. Um, like there, I was just looking emails and, you know, there's one that was organized today with a spouse who's completely overwhelmed with her situation. And she says, I don't know what to think and I don't know what to believe because she's not an American. American. She doesn't know what hap is happening to her. She's in a shelter. And so, you know, again, we really, that legal component, is, I think, is critical. Um, and then, you know, we have developed also a referral list of attorneys, um, uh, national, U, you know, U.S.-based, but also country offices. We're developing that list as we move forward, again, so that we have those excellent resources quick, you know, at hand. Um, and then we bring in, um, you know, our, our colleagues as needed from security, legal ethics, you know, HR. Um, you know, the priority is, is on the confidentiality of that individual that we're helping. And so it really depends on the readiness of that person as far as whether that person is ready to leave, not leave. Does she want to involve the security in, a, let's say, in a country office, which oftentimes are very valuable to accompany someone, let's say, to court or to the police? Because otherwise, you know, I've heard horror stories where the police are drunk or the police are calling the husbands and saying, come get your crazy wife. And so we, we do bring it, we encourage, you know, based on uh, what we think is best for that individual to bring in the partners as needed. So I, I think, you know, it, it, with all trainings that we do, we really need to start with a definition of what is domestic violence. And we use a UN definition for a reason because it's a global. So for example, last year I was doing some trainings to our staff in Sub-Saharan Africa. And we we're talking about, you know, domestic violence in, you know, Zambia or Zimbabwe or South Africa. They may have a completely different definition or interpretation of what domestic violence, re, you know, means. Um, you know, we see all levels of abuse. Um, you know, we when we hire individuals, and it primarily, you know, we're, again, uh, trying to uh, hire more women at the World Bank to reach a parity, at least at senior management. We are, who are the trailing spouses, but these are the men. And so they give up their jobs, they give up their positions, their prestige, and it's very difficult for them. They don't often understand what that transition is going to uh, encompass, the red flags, et cetera. And I can talk a little bit about what we're doing. Um, but anyway, I would say at least 50 to 70 percent of the cases report physical violence, but it's not only physical. And why do they stay? I think that's always a very common uh, question. The hope, they hope that it will end. I mean, you know, it's not like they want the relationship to end. Uh, the financial concerns is huge, the children. Um, the separation violence that was discussed last night and again today, 
And, and that is the most dangerous time. There has to be a very, very well thought out a safety plan and intervention at that point. Again, you're going to get the PowerPoints. Um, in the workplace, again, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but um, all of this is what we see. As far as the flowers, um, some of you may not even recognize that, but I had an IDB client where she worked for a very senior um, individual at the IDB, and every week she would get a dozen roses. And her colleagues thought, gosh, what a nice husband. But there was, you know, again, this was very, very well thought out, and it ended up being an extremely dangerous domestic violence case. Um, and so, again, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but you can read later. How can I help? I think this is really critical because if you're looking at global statistics, one out of three, um, you will come across someone in your lifetime that is dealing with domestic violence. And, you know, we all want to be helpers, particularly women. And I think that it's critical that we you know, we're not in their shoes. And again, that readiness piece is critical. What we, and again, I, I happen to, you know, have a nursing degree as well and background, and I feel very strongly on educating and prevention. So we educate our individuals on their rights and, and ed educate them on their options, and they need to make the best choices, right? And it may not be the leave. In, you know, many cases, leaving can actually put them in more danger and their extended family. Um, so again, um, you know, we have what's called a staff rule, and by the way, our staff rules are all on the external website. Um, so you could look, and I could, you know, I, I left some business cards if you want to see what all our staff rules are related to family um, issues. Managers, again, the communication. Um, you know, what can managers do? Uh, again, refer them out. We don't want managers to take on this responsibility. I've had managers have said, here's my cell number, call me, come to my home. At, at that point, that individual doesn't realize putting themselves and family at risk. And, you know, again, this is part of our training. What do you expect from us? This is what we do. I didn't mention the emergency funds. We provide emergency funds up to about $1,000 for someone to flee. And this is not something we're very vocal about, but I think it's important for you to know. We will pay up to $7,500 for, you know, for someone to obtain a final protection order. Uh, there is a reason for that. We want them to be safe and Quite honestly, I mean, you know, legal aid and all of that, we've got some great resources, but oftentimes they're overwhelmed and they don't have a clue what a G4 is. And we feel like the safety is priority. We've actually gone up to 20,000 for one individual in the past. Um, and, and again, you know, so we look at that as an investment in, in our staff and in, in our families. Um, the perpetrators, we meet with perpetrators as well if they want to uh, contact us. We also uh, do a quick intake and assessment and refer them out as needed. Most perpetrators think they're the victims and they won't come and, you know, reach out for help. Um, you know, tips to create a program. Again, I identified a whole series here to kind of give you ideas of how we've learned you know, what we think is important when you're trying to create an internal program. Uh, awareness, prevention is huge. You want your, your staff to know they have a safe place to go. And ideally, the restrooms tend to be, you know, the best place. We have our brochures printed in six languages. Um, and we are, they're all in, they've been since 2001 in all our restaurants, men and women in D.C., and probably about half of our country offices at that point, at this point. We do awareness events all the time. Um, the one in the middle here was at the IMF in October. We showed a documentary. I mean, I've got every year, October, three organizations to organize events for. So if you have any ideas that you want to share or you want information, I could give you a whole history. A lot of our, our programs are also on our website, by the way, although it's in the new platforms coming out next week. Confidentiality, critical, 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 critical. Um, and then that's where, you know, individuals reach out to us for help. Uh, we have an app. 
Um, and, uh, you know, and we do, I do trainings. I mean, I did a training to Lesotho. Half of you probably don't even know where that is, and I had to actually look it up on a map. Uh, but it's this tiny little country in uh, South, Sub-Saharan Africa, and I did a training last week to Papua New Guinea as well. So we do trainings by VC. We're doing trainings at HQ. Again, I, f I feel that the, you know, the individual trainings uh, per unit is more effective than, let's say, a very large group, then there's more opportunity for Q&A. So I think that's about uh, it. And again, if you have questions, we'll be here to uh, respond. And uh, je parle français, donc uh, if there are French speakers, I'm happy to answer in French too. Thank you very much. And I, by the way, I, I'll leave these brochures here, but to see the brochures from the World Bank, IMF, and IDB, and I can send them electronically if anybody cares. Okay, thank you. Hi, thanks. Um, well, I, my first uh, uh, caveat that I wanted to, to say is that I don't really work in HR. I don't have any specialty in domestic violence. I'm a government affairs and communications uh, person for Rio Tinto, and I cover the Americas. Um, but I was uh, lucky enough to be asked to do the implementation of our domestic violence policy across the Americas after we had implemented it in Australia. Um, and we did this through a white ribbon campaign, which actually started in Canada. And they have the, the largest program is in Australia where they certify companies for having these domestic violence policies. But it's not just about having a policy. It's also about doing the requisite training around that. And so we did that in Australia. And then we decided to do it globally. And that, that's sort of what took us on this journey. So I'm also open to questions, but I will focus more on sort of the trials and tribulations that we went through actually implementing this policy. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Rio Tinto. Rio Tinto is a large diversified mining company. It's one of the top three producers of iron ore, copper, and aluminum. Most of you probably know about Alcan, which is our largest, we're the largest aluminum producer in Canada. Uh, we also have diamonds and uh, diabic in the Northern Territory. We also have iron ore Canada in Labrador. So we have a very big presence in Canada, probably our second largest presence outside of Australia. Um, so uh, we also have operations in South America, in Brazil, Peru, and Chile. And obviously in the United States, we have large copper mines in the United States. Um, we decided to implement this as a guidance um, based on, uh, focused on victims of domestic violence who might work for us. Um, we were also interested in this because we are a male-dominated company. Rio Tinto has 55,000 employees and only 18% women. Um, so it still attracts more men than women, unfortunately. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of associated issues around having very male-dominated uh, industries in terms of the spectrum of issues around harassment, male-on-male -male harassment um, um, that you see a lot at our operations. Um, a lot of male pressure um, without sort of any um, di diversity. I got, you know, you have that sort of group think issues that you have to deal with. So we, we thought this would be a really good thing for us to do. <laughs> we have implemented this as a guidance, which actually in many countries has been actually kind of a problem because of lawyers and litigiousness, and in particular in the U.S. Um, we, but we, we were very determined to have this as a guidance, partly because of the uh, ability for managers to use their own discretion. So our policy is basically 10 days of leave uh, for a, a, a victim of domestic violence, which can be extended far beyond that by your manager. It also includes uh, flexible work schedules if needed for court dates or s certain child custody issues that might arise that you didn't foresee. Um, your manager can then create a different work schedule for you. It also creates financial assistance, and it also creates uh, uh, safety programs that we will um, put to end the financial costs around safety. Um, so the, the whole thing uh, at first was very difficult. The first questions we got is, what does this have to do with us? Why, why, would, we, why would we get involved in something like that? That just kind of seems personal. Um, but really, the, we have a very, very strong safety culture at Rio Tinto, uh, extremely strong safety culture. I would probably say it's our strongest value. And then once we couched it as an issue of safety, it seemed like there were no questions anymore. It sort, sort of seemed to 
completely um, deflate any contradiction of why we would get involved in this. It was immediately like, oh, that totally makes sense. Um, so I think that was an advantage for us because we already had this strong safety culture and we just couched it as an extension of that program. Um, the, the other thing that we had difficulty with was the litigious nature, particularly of the U.S., and the idea that we would write a guidance note as opposed to something that was extremely prescriptive was a horribly painful process. So we were ready to roll this out all over the Americas, and we had to spend another five months arguing with lawyers about the way it was written in the U.S. Because there's some people you get sued in the U.S. for anything. Um, and it is a risk to companies. You know, you're taking on responsibility. You know, you know, if you have a domestic violence policy where you give leave and then something happens to that person, then there's all these lawyers saying that you're going to be liable for anything that happens, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we were like, no, that's not the case. That's not the case. Uh, we can't write guidance notes legal, you know, by legal means. These are guidance notes. These are about culture. These are about how we treat our people. This is about our safety program. And they, we don't have lawyers telling us that, you know, we can't tell people when they go home from work you know, to use safety precautions or to, you know, we tell people to use a take five when they go home from work. We constantly go around telling people, you know, your job is to be safe at home and it's also to be, you know, to be safe at work and it's also your job to be safe at home. So why is that not a privacy violation? I don't understand why that would be an issue, but somehow this is an issue. So we had to get through those. We are still currently um, now rolling this out in South America, but now we have another problem in Chile. Chile has a lot of regulations, and it's the same issue. They're basically saying this is a private matter, and there are rules in Chile that you cannot breach the privacy of a person and work. Where I was like, well, that's ridiculous because we have safety programs, and we have requirements for people to not use their telephone while they're driving a car if you're an employee of Rio Tinto. So am I breaching, you know, what if they're not driving to work? I mean, so anyway, you could just get into these pretzel logic sort of issues. So that has been interesting. That was not something that happened in Australia. Australia had a pretty easy time of it. But once you start talking about multiple countries rolling this stuff out at the same time, you start to hit some of these issues. And then you sort of start to hit some of the cultural issues around just the societies in which you're operating. I mean, it, you know, Chile has probably been the hardest. And Chile also just legalized divorce like 10 years ago. So, you know, it's a very Catholic country. It's very conservative. You know, it's sort of, you know, a little bit harder to deal with that and, you know, it, in Canada was super easy, <laughs> you know, very politically correct. We totally should do all the things that we need to do. And in the States, it was like, oh, my God, we're going to get sued. So, you know, it, it was totally a reflection of, of where we operate. And we've managed to install all of these programs around safety and sexual harassment, all of these with different cultures. And so, therefore, this shouldn't be any different. You know, we just have to adjust locally. So I think that was a, a, a really interesting process. I think the thing that really came out is the need for training. As I've told people as I'm coming to talk at a domestic violence uh, panel in Toronto, which of course is not my day job, so it does it is interesting. Unbelievable how everybody's response is. I had a friend who had an issue with domestic violence. My sister, my mom, I grew. I mean, every single person that I talked to, um, and every person that I talk about the fact that I've been involved in this rollout, every single person knows somebody, has somebody, or has experienced it themselves, including when I was checking into this hotel. So I just find it interesting how, how um, common or how not uncommon it is, and yet it still seems like something that people don't want to get involved in, don't think it has anything to do with them, um, and don't feel any sense of responsibility. And, and, and so that's where I think training has really become incredibly important to really equip our employees to be able to deal with their colleagues, but as well as to try and understand why we're doing this, why it's important for them to look out for these issues, and how a domestic violence situation can put them at risk at work. Um, most of the people that I talked to who had a domestic violence person that they knew or friend, all of them involved a work story, followed them to work, um, distracted at work, ended up getting fired, you know, et cetera, et cetera. All of it involved some kind of work. And for Rio Tinto, we really wanted to be a, a place where people could come to and feel safe to say, I'm having this situation and I don't know what to do. And have somebody at Rio Tinto, whether it be your supervisor or somebody else, 
be able to say, well, let's just work this out and figure out how we're going to do it, whether that be relieving financial pressure, whether that be giving time, uh, whether that be giving uh, a safety plan, new computer, new phone, whatever it might be. And, and the importance was that managers have to use their discretion, and it cannot be prescriptive. Not everybody needs 10 days. Some people need 20. Some people need one. All, all of domestic abuse situations vary from very severe to emotional abuse uh, to economic abuse. Um, and so it, 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 there's a lot of variety, and there's not one size fits all. And that requires an incredible amount of training. So we've actually hired Michael Kaufman, who is well known in this area, Canadian, um, who started, was one of the founders of the White Ribbon Campaign. And he and Promundo, who I believe the World Bank uses a lot too, they uh, specialized in these issues and training around these issues. Um, and they basically designed our training program. And we have done train the trainer. So obviously that makes it cheaper and more flexible to have people internally trained to do this that Promundo and Michael Kaufman have trained to then expand the training and keep moving forward um, with the situation. I think um, the one thing that I found uh, really interesting about Michael Kaufman and his work with Rio Tinto is really the, the issue around our gender diversity or lack thereof, um, gender diversity at Rio Tinto and issues around sexual harassment and harassment. And the whole idea of men taking charge. And, and really, Rio Tinto will not be successful if men do not lead this, because that's all we have is men. We don't have very many women. Um, I think another important thing to note is that Rio Tinto also, when they rolled it out in the Americas, extended. We didn't do this in Australia, but then when we did it in the Americas, uh, we argued very strongly to have this extend to family <coughs> members. So um, if you are a worker, at Rio Tinto and your daughter is going through a domestic violence situation, you are entitled to 10 days of leave to help her with that situation. So the, the, it isn't just for victims, it is for immediate family members. And, and particularly in a male-dominated industry, we thought that would help connect better with all of the employees. Because once you talk about domestic violence, most men will start to, like you'll be in a conference room and it starts like this. You know, like I'm a perpetrator, I'm a man, I'm the domestic violence person to, you know, once you start talking about helping out your own family members and looking out for your own family members, it's sort of more inclusive and it's more about them as much about some unnamed woman who might be going through some situation and we have to have this policy and I don't know why I'm in this training and I don't know why I'm here and I don't know what this has to do with this. So I thought he, he's been very good at that. I think one of the things that it's uh, really helped at Rio Tinto, having been at Rio Tinto for 20 years, is the small things, you know. It's, it's the inappropriate joke. It's the, the slight comment that really empowers people, and particularly men, to say something about how that is inappropriate or not appropriate. And I, I think the one thing that isn't discussed a lot is sort of the, well, I mean, it happens to everybody, everybody who works, right? You have a certain culture um, your boss makes an inappropriate comment. Do you correct your boss? Is that appropriate? Do you get fired for that? Do you not get promoted if you do that? And so how do you create a culture where sort of those kinds of comments aren't okay, no matter who says it, and there's a way to be able to call people out without creating yet a new situation of controversy? One anecdote, when I was telling somebody yesterday, we were talking about energy efficiency and climate smart mining and all kinds of, you know, non-related issues. And I mentioned that I was coming to this panel. This person told me that he had a very good friend. He went to Pomona College, and he had a very good friend. And his best friend basically ended up having a boyfriend who killed her. Um, uh, as a, They broke up, just like you said. It was when she had left, and, and he... Uh, uh, and anyway, he was involved in the whole issue, and he told her not to go to dinner with him, and one thing led to another... And then he said he had another situation where his friend was the perpetrator and he had to intervene. And they were living in Switzerland and he had to intervene to deal with the situation, including calling their parents. And none of the parents wanted to get involved. These were, they were married with a kid. Um, and then anyway, he went to college with him. He was best friends with him in college. And, and he had to uh, intervene in the situation on behalf of the woman that he was married to. And many years later, 15 years later, he was in Washington, D.C., and he had been ignoring him. He basically didn't want to. Um, and 
uh, I don't know why I'm telling the story. But anyway, um, he had been ignoring him and not, not talking to him. And then another friend of theirs, a mutual friend in Washington, said, I'm going to have dinner with Jeff. Will you join us? And then he thought, you know, maybe Jeff is trying to tell me something. Maybe Jeff has been trying to communicate to me. Um, and maybe I need to give him that opportunity. And they went to dinner, and it only confirmed all the things that he already knew about Jeff. And he was seething, angry, and decided um, that he, you know, he was, and I said, well, why? And he was like, well, he was basically making comments about his wife, making excuses as if she had provoked the situation. And I remember saying, did you say anything? Or did you just leave angry? And uh, he was like, no, I just left angry. And uh, I was like, you know, I think, I think actually it, that would have been a really, not to make him, I was like, I'm not trying to make you feel bad, like you really missed an opportunity. But, you know, well, I think what's really important is um, to say something and to say it sounds like you're making excuses. Um, you know, it, I mean, even just a simple comment, like I don't agree, uh, I think would go a long way. And I remember in my own work history, not at Rio Tinto, because we're very nice at Rio Tinto, mostly Canadians. Um, but when I worked on the Hill for a U.S. senator, um, I remember working late as a 20-something-year-old woman and somebody making a very inappropriate comment towards me in front of three or four men standing there. And I don't, I don't remember being angry at the man who made that comment, though I do still remember it. Um, I was mostly angry that my colleagues said nothing and did nothing. And then when I asked them about it the next day, they said they didn't, oh, I didn't hear. And that has stayed with me all of my life, which is the, 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 the power of, of saying something that makes you know, another person feel bad rather than, wow, look at my shoes. They are so interesting at this moment. And you know, I think we all do that. We've all been in that situation. It's all, you know, it can be very awkward, but I think you can create a culture where that doesn't happen and that doesn't occur. And so at Rio, we're sort of trying to go on that journey, but it hasn't been easy. And um, now we're about to go into uh, do this in Mongolia. We're going to do this in Africa. And, you know, in OECD countries like Australia, Canada, and the U.S., um, you know, it, I don't want to say it's easy. It hasn't been easy. But, you know, actually my colleague at the World Bank is somebody who I'm going to be leaning on a lot because they have some of the very same qualities that Rio Tinto has. It's very global. It's very international. You're dealing with lots of different jurisdictions. And I've already started to steal liberally from uh, the World Bank. As a matter of fact, one of the things that you didn't mention that I thought was really great that I've now started internal discussions about is that we move people around all over the world. And we, we, we move them with a trailing spouse situation. And not until very recently has Rio Tinto ever acknowledged that they bear some responsibility for the impact that this has on families. And so we've now started to extend that in terms of our safety considerations and also our mental health. Now we're really big on mental health. And one of the things the World Bank does is offer uh, couples counseling for people who have gone through these big moves. And that's something that now we're looking at. We have these employee services, but really actually advertising and focusing on that actually you can reach out. If, you're, you know, if your trailing spouse is having difficulty you know, readjusting, having moved, you know. we also make people travel. We have some people who work for Rio Tinto travel 75% of the time. Um, and especially when you come on to Rio Tinto, sometimes it can be 50. It's not uncommon for it to be 50. It's pretty rare. I mean, the top executives, 75, but being 50, gone 50% of the time. You're not home six months out of the year. That, that, that is actually incredibly significant. And we do it like there is not, not a blink of an eye. Can you be in Mongolia? Can you leave tomorrow? Oh, okay. You know? So, um, and, and, and there's really a lot of issues around that. And I don't think we necessarily... Um, understand the impact that it has on families. And we really, if anything, we, under, we think more about women than we think about men. You know, we, we, we constantly think, you know, I get asked all the time, you know, is it, can you go somewhere, um, you know, is that going to be okay with your family? And I'm like, well, why don't you ask my male colleague if it's going to be okay with the family? You never ask him. You always ask me. And so it's like I need permission and they don't. And you know what I mean? So I think there are a lot of cultural battles that need to be won before you can truly take advantage and value of some of these policies that we're implementing. I'll leave it at that. <laughs>